Hey, welcome to 12 Tone. Lots of composers write difficult music. Rachmaninoff is famous for his technically demanding compositions as are Chopin, Liszt, and many others. So Rob G's Opus Clavis Symbolisticum is a four-hour piece for solo piano filled with blazingly fast, wide-ranging counterpoint, and it's so hard to play that Sarab G eventually banned public performances of it, declaring that no performance at all is vastly preferable to an obscene travesty. But it's still possible to play it. Like, a human being could do it if they were good enough at piano. The same can't be said for the works of Kon Lon Nankero. Nankero was a Mexican composer in the 20th century who became fascinated with the idea of polyrhythms. We've talked about these before, and they're a fairly simple concept. Basically, you just have two different parts playing a different number of beats in the same amount of time. Like, if you have one part playing two beats per bar, and another playing three per bar, you can put them together to make what's called a hemiola, or three against two polyrhythm. Another way to look at that though is as two parts playing at different tempos. That is, instead of changing how many beats they play in each bar, we could just change how long a bar is. In our hemiola, we could say that the faster part is playing three bars of music in the time it takes the slower one to play two, meaning that its tempo is 50% faster. Nancaro's interest in this was inspired in part by a book called New Musical Resources by Henry Cowell. Cowell was interested in the relationship between rhythm and pitch. After all, a note is just a sound wave with a specific frequency, and in a sense, a frequency is just a really, really fast tempo. This A hits your ear 220 times per second, and if you play a drum beat 220 times per second, well, it sounds similar at least. Not as pretty, but it proves the point. Pitches are kind of just really fast rhythms, and Cowell wondered if the same principle could work in the other direction. Are rhythms just really slow pitches, and if so, can we build a sort of rhythmic harmony out of them? Well, in order to do that, we need to look at how intervals work, starting with something called the harmonic series. This is just a list of all the multiples of a given fundamental frequency. So if we start with 220, its harmonics would include 440, 660, 880, 1100, and so on. This gives us a predictable set of frequency ratios, and those ratios are how we define different intervals. For instance, the octave, or strongest interval, is a doubling in frequency. The perfect fifth is a ratio of 3 to 2, and it's only slightly less stable. Then the perfect fourth is 4 to 3, the major third is 5 to 4, and so on. And since frequencies are fast tempos, couldn't we just slow those intervals down into polyrhythms? Well, yes and no. Cowell did indeed lay out a framework for what he called tempo scales, where the relationships between multiple tempos played at once are used in much the same way we would use pitches and intervals. For instance, the hemiola is a 3 to 2 ratio, and the perfect fifth is also a 3 to 2 ratio, so we can treat them as basically the same thing, just at very different speeds. We can even create chords. The three notes of a major triad have the ratio 4 to 5 to 6, and rhythms with the same tempo ratio could be thought of as almost rhythmic triads. But Cowell also recognized that writing complex pieces based on these ideas would ultimately be kind of pointless because the precision necessary in order to accurately capture the subtle rhythmic relationships his system needed were beyond what humans were capable of. Even the best musicians aren't entirely consistent in their meter, and small variations could completely ruin what Cowell was trying to build. Imagine trying to faithfully switch from 150 beats per minute to 168. Computers could do it, of course, but since Cowell's book was first published in 1930, that wasn't an option. Instead, he left the idea with this offhand comment. The almost insurmountable complexity of this procedure is now sufficiently evident. It would be interesting, though, to hear such rhythms cut on a player piano roll. And that is where Nankero comes back into the picture. Player pianos were a popular device in the early 20th century that were, in effect, pianos that could play themselves. You programmed them by punching holes into long strips of paper that you then ran over detectors, and whenever a hole passed over, the piano played the corresponding note. This allowed clubs, bars, and even homes to enjoy piano music with without needing to find a competent piano player. The instrument would take care of that itself. For a while, that was all the player piano was, a replacement for a human musician playing basically the same things a human would. Nancaro, though, recognized much greater potential. You see, human players have lots of physical limitations. For instance, most people have no more than 10 fingers, which means that precisely playing more than 10 notes at once is pretty much impossible. We're also limited in range. An adult human hand can only stretch to a little over an octave, and since we only have two hands, we can't play notes all across the keyboard simultaneously. There's other problems, like speeds and complexities too advanced for even highly competent humans, but player pianos have no such issues. Want an 8-octave power chord? It can do that. Want a 64th note run at 200 beats per minute? 
It can do that too. But most importantly, do you want to be able to precisely subdivide very complex polyrhythms? Because as long as you put the holes in the right places, it can do that just fine. This gave Nankero the tools he needed to begin exploring Cowell's rhythmic intervals in earnest. He started simple. Many of his early works stick to fairly straightforward ratios. For instance, his study number 13 is based on a ratio of 5 to 4, effectively a major third. But Nankero quickly tired of those sorts of simplistic designs and set out to do more and more complicated things. His study number 37, for instance, has 12 different tempos, each representing a different note of Cowell's tempo scale. Each voice plays the same basic melody, but at a different speed and starting on a different note. This creates a somewhat surprising effect where at first it feels like you're hearing a single chord across all the voices, and then as they drift further and further apart in time, it starts to sound more and more chaotic. If you want to check that out, I put a link in the description. He also experimented with irrational and even transcendental number ratios, which aren't just impossible for humans to play, they're impossible to even count. Nankero was largely uninterested in harmony and melody, viewing them as merely a means of exploring his rhythmic ideas. He once said in an interview that, for me, chords are just blocks of notes I can use to make a rhythm. Many of his pieces use the same melody in all the different tempos to better emphasize the distinctions between them. After all, if the rhythms of the melody are different, it's much harder to tell that they're also being played at different speeds. Nankero's work is a great example of what happens when we're willing to completely re-examine our assumptions about what music is and how it works, and while you may or may not enjoy listening to it, you have to admit it's completely unique. Oh, and if you want to learn more about Nankero, Adam Neely's done a video about him too. I'll link to that in the description. Anyway, thanks for watching. If you want to help make these videos possible, please consider supporting 12 Tone on Patreon or checking out our store. You can also join our mailing list to find out about new episodes, like, share, comment, subscribe, and keep on rocking.